So today um, we are going to be talking about, and I put as a subtopic there, glorifying God in everything and for everything. Now this does not mean that we do not have things that happen in our lives that are, are difficult and distressing. And it certainly does, also does not mean that everything that happens to us is all part of like God's will, because I think there's very specific things that happen that are very clearly not God's will. And one of those things that you all know about is sin. So from the very beginning, God communicates that his will is that we would not sin and that we would not die. And from the very beginning, you find out that God doesn't always get his way. And so if someone who loves us does not always get his way, then it makes sense that those who love him also experience the same. However, all those things being said, God does some amazing things. I explained a situation before where my wife was going to a store, and when she went to that store, she noticed that there was a gentleman that seemed to be kind of following her around in the store. And something about him just gave her that vibe. Everybody's kind of familiar with that vibe that sometimes somebody just, something about him doesn't quite seem right. And this is not judging people, but they've done studies that demonstrate that we actually do have intuitions that hint us in into people's motives. And for people who suffer from a personality disorder called antisocial personality disorder, they seem to be particularly, I wouldn't say easy to spot, but definitely can be spotted. And it's because for these folks, when they look at people, they kind of look through them. People are like objects. Um, it's one of the most distressing disorders that's out there because we can't find a single treatment that works because the, folk, the only treatment that works for them is locking them up. I mean, it's actually a disorder that's very real. So in either case, my wife was walking around, and she got those heebie-jeebie vibes. That's a technical term from this person. And she was paying for the stuff. And when she had parked the car, there was no one parked next to her. When she walked out, there was this big, what we have labeled kidnapper vans, and you all know what those look like. And he was talking to her and just seemed really agitated and, like, shaken, really paying a lot of attention to our children. Now, for her, she didn't quite make anything of it at the moment, but, uh, but as he continued to talk to her, just she had this impression, you know, lock the doors. Uh, and after she put the kids in the car, she locks the doors, and she talked about how she just immediately saw him kind of deflate, immediately lost interest, and just as soon as she had turned around and got into the car, he was gone before she could even watch him drive off. Now, the only reason why I'm able to tell that story, and you can all say amen instead of God help you, is because one little moment, one little impression transformed that moment from being a tragedy to being an intervention from God. And that's just one that we can see. Now, that is not to say that tragedies don't happen to us. That was just the miracle for that day. But every day we are faced with challenges, and the conclusion I came to after that is that it is incredibly important, first of all, to thank God for the times that we have made it. If you are alive, I want to tell you that, that many, many miracles have helped you to get to where you are today. And on the second piece of it, it also became incredibly apparent to me that listening to every, every word that comes from the mouth of God is also incredibly important. Because whether we recognize it or not, I've come to believe that every word that God gives us, even when it seems to be trivial, is always a life or death. So happy Sabbath, everyone. That was kind of heavy, wasn't it? <laughs> So let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for blessing us with another day of life. For we know that this is a miracle. And I pray that today, as we'll be talking about some things that are slightly technical, but mostly that are very practical, I pray that all of our hearts would be open to receive the blessing that you intend for us today. And I ask for this gift in the name of Jesus. Amen. I wanted us to talk about this topic of everyday miracles. And some of you may not recognize what that picture is. And that's because your eyes don't seem to work like a high-powered electron microscope. Uh, but that right there, those little hair things are called cilia. Okay? And so these little hair-like things are on just about all of your cells. They help to move things around. They help cells communicate uh, with one another. And they also are what help other cells to like swim around. So uh, you have cells that have like a little whip or a little tail that helps them propel around. Well, anyway, these uh, cilia are found on almost all the cells in your body. Now, you might wonder why I put that picture there. Well, it's because it's one of these evidences, at least to me, that life rests on a very fine razor's edge. It turns out that if, um, if one of the genes that helps to make those things uh, has a mutation, just even one or two in the wrong place, 
that those things will stop working. Now, the side effects are huge because it, it affects how a baby develops. And one of the things uh, that can happen is called situs inversus, where the organs on your body are on the wrong side. And sometimes we can survive that, but when they did this experiment with mice, they found that they would actually die before they were born. And it's only because of a small mutation on a very small hair-like structure that is on almost all of your cells. To put that differently, your life and death can be hanging on the instructions for one of those little things right there. Life is very, very finely balanced. The fact that we actually continue to live, to me, is nothing short of a miracle. The other place where you'll find this is actually on your lungs. It really helps to, to move along the mucus. That's actually useful, too. Otherwise, your lungs would puddle up with mucus and so on and so forth. All right, so what we're going to do is, first, we're going to look at how you define a miracle. The second thing we're going to do is look at the displays of his miraculous power in creation, displays of his miraculous power in providence, his providence and his mindful acts of us. And the last one we're going to do is look at displays of his wondrous love, which I believe I'll be able to show to you is the greatest miracle of all. So, everybody turn in your Bibles to the book of Genesis to find out how we define miracles. All right, so everybody understands that creation itself is a miracle, right? So when you look all throughout Genesis chapter 1, every time God says something, what happens? It happens. Like, right, he, said, he speaks and, it, and it's done. He commanded and he stood fast, like what it talks about in Psalm. We find out that God goes around creating all of these things, with the exception of the sun, moon, and stars, the first four days. Everything else afterwards is alive. And I want to submit to you that life itself is a miracle. However, there's something that, at first glance anyway, does not seem very miraculous. So let's just take a look in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 16. And it says, And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt what? Surely die. God gives him a, a commandment. And what's the commandment say, everyone? Yeah, don't eat from the tree. And if you eat from the tree, what will happen? You'll die. Now, that law, did that create Adam's life? No, it did not. What was the law designed to do? It was designed to keep him alive, yes. Laws do not create life, they sustain life. Laws tend to be the boundary around what we think is miraculous and what we think is not miraculous. No one thinks it's miraculous that if I drop my pencil, it hits the ground, because we know that's what the law says. But if I drop my pencil and it goes up, for no apparent reason, then that seems to look miraculous, right? One of the things that we know is if the law can't do it, then that makes it miraculous. We know that the law did not create Adam. So that would mean that creation is a miracle. So jump with me over to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. Now this is after they sinned, God begins to talk to them about the results and consequences of their sins. So he's speaking to the serpent. He says, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. I want you to notice this, because in the verse prior to, he just says that the serpent's going to be cursed, he's going to crawl on his belly. God does not say, I will do this, it just says this will happen. Now, one of the reasons that I believe that this happens is because in that first law, where God speaks, it says, in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. The word there, surely die, means in dying thou shalt die which means that death would be a breakdown process. If the serpent indeed had legs, would it make sense that as, as it's breaking down, it would lose its legs? One of the things that we find is that sin will bring decay. So that's a natural thing that happened as a result of sin. However, he says that enmity will exist between the serpent and the woman's seed. That means between human beings and Satan. I want you to notice that that is not natural. Well, how does the enmity get there? So look at that in the first few words in the verse 15. How do we get to the place that we don't like Satan anymore? God puts it there, which would mean that a divorce from sin or no longer choosing Satan's side would have to be a miracle because the law does not make you stop listening to the devil. One of the miracles that we find is the miracle of creation, and then we find a second miracle of salvation. And one of the dictionary definitions is a miracle is a surprising and welcome event it is not explicable by natural or scientific laws and is therefore considered to be the work of a divine agency. So let's rewind the tape for a second here. When I told you the story about my wife and avoiding our children getting kidnapped, and perhaps her as well, did that sound like a miracle? Now, what made it sound like a miracle? I mean, is it a miracle to avoid a creepy guy? 
Sometimes, yeah, that's right. What, what made it a miracle for her, and I didn't tell you the last part of the story, is she didn't realize what was going on until she got home. She said as soon as she opened the garage door, she was just like immediately felt like this flood of panic. And I think that, that that part is also probably miraculous because if she would have panicked in the moment, who knows how that would have changed everything else. And so one of the ways I think in which God demonstrates miracles is not by going around breaking laws of nature, but by using them in a certain way so as to create an outcome. So it's kind of like building a car. Are cars miraculous? No, not necessarily. But would it be miraculous if it happened all by itself? Yes. And that human intervention makes the difference between whether or not we look at it as a natural phenomenon or supernatural. And I want to submit to you that we are surrounded by miracles all the time. Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 29, it says, The secret things belong to who? Unto the Lord our God. But those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever. And for what purpose? It says that we may do all the words of this law. Everything that God shows us, he shows us so that we will follow him. But there are things that are secret that only belong to God. The number of secrets that God is keeping, I think, in some ways are shrinking, but there are always going to be a lot of mysteries that we don't know. But the things that we can see are always supposed to lead us to want to do what God has told us to do. Let's take a little more consideration. Let's look back at this commandment here. So we were there in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 16 and 17. God gives them this law. And what is the purpose for giving them this law? Not to eat from the tree. Yeah, to protect them. He wants them to live. He wants them to live. Now let's take a look at a second example. And this one is where things start to get hairy because after this section in Scripture, we no longer have a perfect world. So look with me at Genesis chapter 4 in verse 5. Now here goes a tragedy. And unto Cain and unto his offering he had not respect. If you know the story already, Abel brought his offering and God accepted it. Cain brings his offering and God does not accept it. Now, in this story, you already know how the story ends. What is about to happen with Cain? What is he thinking of doing? Does y'all remember this? He's thinking of killing his brother. Is that a tragedy? It absolutely is. Now, we see the outcome of this tragedy, but God lets us see behind the scenes what was going on to prevent this tragedy. Look at me at the rest of verse 5, and it says, And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the immediate moment in which sin began to grow in this man's heart, who was there in verse 6? God. So one of the things I want to lay out to you, brothers and sisters, is that even when something evil or bad happens, I want you to keep this in mind, that God immediately shows up on the scene to try to prevent this thing. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Now, the way that's written in the King James is very confusing, but what he essentially told Cain is that, look, if you do what's right, then you're going to be accepted. And if you don't do what's right, then sin is going to take over. But you should be able to rule over this. And the Opposite would also be true. God did not want sin to take over Cain's life. Now, why not? Let's just examine the question for a second. If sin takes over Cain's life, who first and foremost do you know is going to die? Cain. Now, this is one of the ways in which God is a little bit different from us. Because for us, it would make sense to go and try to reason with the victim and try to warn them that there's something's wrong with this man. But you know, it's much more effective to stop the criminal than to simply spare a single victim. If you arrest a guy who's planning on murdering lots of people, if you only save one of them, that's not going to have the, nearly as large an impact as if you just stop the guy from killing anybody. So number one thing we found out here is that God does speak. God does try to do something to stop the evil in the world. Now, some people might be thinking, could have just killed Cain. Again, this is where the difference is, is that God did not want Cain to die. The tragedy isn't just that Abel died, but the tragedy is also that Cain killed him. Verse 8, and it says, And Cain talked with Abel his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. Now I want you to notice a couple of things here that stood out to me. First of all, what did Cain do after he had this conversation with God? Did he warn his brother that I'm really angry at you? Nope, he kept it to himself. 
Now, you might be asking, did God do anything to spare Abel? Well, I want you to notice something. Where did Cain take Abel? He took him out into the field. Why there? Yes, to hide. No witnesses. Now, I want to submit to you, based on the verses that you can find in 1 John, that I believe that Abel had a sense that something was off about his brother. But what did it say that they were doing together while they were walking out there? Talking. Now, if you knew that somebody was struggling with something, and maybe your first thought wasn't to protect yourself but to try to change them, what might you talk to them about? Would you maybe try to talk them out of doing the bad thing they're thinking of doing? Mm. What if you really love that person? Would you try to talk them out of it? So here goes one of the things that I have found. When people are suicidal, they're also that disposition to want to hurt oneself is also related to the disposition to want to hurt somebody else. Or to say it differently, homicide and suicide are really good friends. That means when you are talking to someone who is suicidal, they're not just a danger to themselves. They're also a danger to who else? To you. Now, did Abel know that Cain did something wrong? Well, he did. Everybody saw that. God accepted Abel's offering, not Cain's. I would submit that if you look at what Christ did and how Abel is compared to Jesus, I believe with every fiber of my being that Abel tried to talk his brother out of doing evil. And his brother killed him for it. Now, the way it says it in 1 John is it says that why did Cain kill his brother? It says because his brother's works were righteous and his were evil. That's why he killed him. Now, I want to submit to you that likely what happened with Abel is that he was martyred. He was not just murdered he was martyred. But one of the things that I take from this is if we look at the first commandment that we see here and the second warning that we see to Cain, it is imperative that we listen to every word that God says. Well, where do I find this? <clears throat> In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 20, John talks about this. He says, but you have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. Does anybody know what an unction is? We don't really talk like that anymore. Anybody know what an unction is? Yeah, it's like an urge, something that pushes us. And it says that that urge comes from the Spirit of God. If we don't listen to that urge, what is the outcome? Well, take a look here. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 14 through 16, it says, But the word is very nigh unto thee. It is in thy mouth and in thine heart that thou mayest do it. See, I have set before thee this day life and good, and what else? Death and evil. So where does the good come from? Well, the good comes from listening to what God has told us, and evil is a result of what? Not listening to God. So why is there evil in the world? It's because people don't listen to God. Simple as that. Cain killed his brother because he didn't listen to God. It wasn't because God just was like, oh, I don't care about Abel. He can just die. He's a Christian. That's okay. Because afterwards you find God saying some interesting words. He says that your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. It hurt God to see one of his children die. And I want to submit to you that what's a tragedy for us is also a tragedy for God. This idea that, you know, maybe it was the Lord's will that you get cancer. I mean, I think sometimes the Lord will use sickness to get our attention. But look, I mean, I, I really doubt that that was in God's plans every single time, you know, like create the world, give Bill cancer. That is not how God sits around drawing up his map. Evil comes into the world because we don't listen. That also tells you where good comes from, by the way. It says, every good gift and every perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Let's look at a few miracles in creation. Y'all have seen these really beautiful pictures of the sun before, right? You've seen, uh, like, these really close-up images where you can see, out, like, out in space. So one of the things that happen sometimes is a solar flare. So has anybody seen those pictures where there's, like, this little, you know, band that kind of jumps off the sun? So one of the things they're worried about is with these little solar flares is that it can knock out all the, the electricity and things that are powered on the earth because of some of the rays that will like disrupt all the, like the microwaves, it can fry all your computers all at once. Now, I used to think, okay, that's pretty bad. Until I found out that when they do a survey of all the stars in the, in the galaxy that are just like ours, 
they found out that most of them experience what are called supersolar flares. And these flares are very, very frequent. Now, these flares are so bad that if you had one of these happen, it would melt all the ice all the way out to Jupiter, wipe out our atmosphere completely. And the frequency is anywhere from once every year to once every hundred years. And for some reason, we got stuck with the sun that's incredibly stable and has never had one of these flares as long as we can tell. Now, how did it happen that we ended up with the one sun that doesn't just blow the atmosphere away and roast us alive? How did that happen? Yes. And we're surrounded by evidence that all the other sun-like stars don't work that way. I have this sense that God is good. Now, even if one of the smaller flares had happened, it would actually do something to where if you remove the ozone layer and maybe we survived, it would disrupt photosynthesis. Now, everybody remember what photosynthesis is for? Plants, all right? So all the plants would die because no longer that nice little effect that the atmosphere gives us, give that kind of light to the plants, it would just disappear. So if you take all the plants off the earth, what happens? There's no food. Is that a problem? It sure is, isn't it? And yet somehow we have a sun that just happens to stay obedient all the time. Man, I, th I think sometimes we just don't realize how often God is intervening. Some of you probably don't recognize what this is. It's what's called like an ATP synthase motor. You don't have to remember that word. But this is a little motor that spins around and creates energy for your cells. This is just a part of your cells that help keep your cell alive and powered. It uses uh, adenosine triphosphate or ATP to keep everything alive. Now, every living thing has this in there. One of the reasons why this is so significant is because that little motor that you see, those little yellow dots coming up, those are protons that help it keep going. And that thing spins at a rate of 7,000 rotations per minute. These things are so small that you can fit 100,000 of them in a single millimeter. Without these things working properly, you would die. Everybody knows that cyanide is poisonous? Do you know why it's poisonous? It stops that little motor right there. It freezes it. And if your cells stop getting energy, what happens to you? You die. Now, you might be wondering why I bring this up. Well, cyanide is all over the place. In fact, if you eat enough apple seeds, you can die from cyanide poisoning because there is cyanide in the middle of the apple seeds. Now, what does your body do when cyanide gets in there? Well, it sends out vitamin B12. And vitamin B12, its main function is to bind around cyanide and carry it out of your body. So where do you get vitamin B12 from? Well, you get them from foods. Yeah, and actually you can get vitamin B12 by not brushing your teeth, I don't recommend that. By not washing your produce, also don't recommend that. And a lot of times it's really super abundant in meat, which I have uh, slim recommendations on that if you're starving. But one of the ways you can get it is from things like nutritional yeast flakes, because they don't have all the side effects that other kinds of dietary things have. And so God tells us to eat some things and not eat other things. And you're like, oh, that's a silly rule. Why would you have us do that? And it could be because God is trying to make sure that cyanide does not kill you. Now, how do you explain cyanide to people that don't even know that this thing is working inside their body? Well, you don't. You just say, trust me. Eat this thing here. It's really good for you. Try it out. Well, you guys remember that little cilia thing I showed you before? Well, one of those little hair things, it has, the best way to picture this is to imagine a bunch of trains going along the top of this little hair-like thing. What it does is each time it goes up to the top, it drops off little proteins to make it longer, right? And it needs to be a certain length because if it's too small, it doesn't get the job done. It's like having arms that are too short to reach something. It's just not effective. Well, it turns out that much like the law of God, once the law is there, that's not necessarily good enough. Because if you take it away, let's say the person was born with perfectly healthy cells and all these little things are working just fine. It turns out that if you... <coughs> break that little law, we're going to call it, that keeps that thing going, it'll stop dropping things off. Those little trains will stop dropping things off on the top of that little cell, and guess what happens? It begins to wither away. It doesn't just die, but it slowly decays and breaks down until there's nothing left. Does that sound anything like that tree that we were told not to eat of, that in dying thou shalt die? Things break down until they fall apart because it has to stay there in order to sustain life. Now, you see this, this young child is crying, one of the other little miracles that God has put in us is tears. 
Now that fluid that secretes out of your eye is like a saline solution, that means it has some salt in it, but it also has a bunch of antibacterial stuff in there. And it turns out that 95% of what makes contact with your eye never infects it, not because it's not infectious, but because this fluid just happens to kill it before you even know about it. And for the things that it might have a harder time killing, like let's say a fly or a small bug, because my wife had something crawling on her eye and she asked me to get it out and I tried to get it and I'm clumsy and so like, I pushed it further in there. And so poor wife, and you see this thing just crawl into the back of her eye and then she was blinking. She's like, oh my goodness, I cannot believe you just let this happen. And like, so I was a bad guy for that day. But then we were watching and then later on, like all the little bits and pieces of bug came out of her eye. And I was like, what in the world just happened? Well, it turns out that all the fluid that's flushing through there and the actual action of blinking crushed the thing into little bits and then just leaked it right out and she wouldn't have. And you know, if I didn't see the bug in her eye, she wouldn't even know it was there. But we got to witness a little miracle. And here goes one of the best miracles I've I've come to find about God is that God does miracles when we don't even know that he's doing them. There's so many things that we just take for granted because we don't pay attention to them. So it flushes all the bad stuff out of your eye. But what about... This little girl, because she is not crying because she got something in her eye. Unlikely that she's crying because she got something in her eye. One of your hints of that is that the facial expression suggests that she's experiencing something emotionally. And what would we call that? Well, it could be some anger, some anguish, some distress. You all know these faces. Maybe there's a tantrum going on. Everybody goes right to the negative ones. <laughs> right? So, yeah, she could definitely be experiencing that. Let's take a look at something. You're still there in Genesis? All right, so you remember one of our rules is that if a law is doing it, then it probably isn't going to be looked at as a miracle. But if something happens outside of that law, we can say that God is intervening and therefore there could be a miracle. So jump with me back to Genesis chapter 3, and I want you to see something. Verse 16. Now, some of you might find this disturbing initially, but then we're going to really break this thing down. And we're going to look at what God says to Eve. It's interesting, 316, because this is a promise about Messiah. Just another way to remember this verse if you care to. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow. Now, does anybody's Bible say something different than sorrow? Pain. All right. Now, this word sorrow actually means both physical and emotional pain. Now, let me ask you a question. Where does the sorrow come from? Is it just a natural outcome? It comes from God. That probably is an uncomfortable answer. Like, where does pain and suffering come from? Well, in some place here, it sounds like God created pain. Now, why on earth would God create pain? I want you to notice something, first of all. Did God create the cause of pain? No, he did not. Did he create the response of pain? Yes, he did. Yes. Now, I thank God every day that pain exists now that I have children. Because if certain things didn't hurt, they wouldn't stop doing them. There was a young girl who was born with a pain disorder, and so she could not feel the pain that most of us would feel. And so she'd go around playing with things. If she put her hand on a stove, she'd be interested in how it smelled and looking at bubbles and stuff like that. Us, we'd be horrified because we know what that feels like. But she didn't feel anything. So she would have scars all over her body. Well, one night they left her in her room, and she was sleeping, no big deal. And she got to playing and, you know, touching things like little children do. But unlike other little children, nothing hurt. So she started touching her eyes. And then she was like, oh, that feels so neat. And then she started scratching at her eyes. And she scratched so much that her vision is permanently impaired now. She felt no pain. And so she saw no reason to stop. Now, brothers and sisters, God put pain in this world because when we do something that is wrong, like what Cain did to his brother, Did that cause somebody pain? It did. Namely, his parents. Anybody that would have loved this person would have felt that pain. And because they felt pain, they would do something to stop it. There are beautiful organizations out there. Like there's one called Awaken, which is a a local place in Reno where they actually do counseling services, and provide all kinds of supports for children who've been caught in sex trafficking. But do you know why that organization exists? It's because someone got hurt. People don't do anything to stop things until they feel the pain. 
some of you may not know this, a dirty little secret in psychology, when there used to be father-daughter problems, and you all read between the lines for me, please, because I don't want to be uh, overly explicit with anyone. When they used to have those kind of problems, the DSM originally had it in there that this might be beneficial to the little girl, that it would help build her confidence. And so no one did anything to stop it. And when women came in reporting symptoms of hysteria, everyone thought it was just her being crazy. And when she would share these stories about what happened with her own parent, nobody believed her. And the reason no one believed her is because instead of that news hurting someone, they took pleasure in it. And so no one stopped until that cry got loud enough for someone to do something about it. So God allows there to be pain in the world because it's supposed to send a signal to the world that something is wrong, that something needs to stop. We should have, it should bother us when people die from diseases and all these other kinds of things. It should, we, that pain is not just theirs. The reason we have emotions, by the way, is so that we don't just feel our own pain, but that's so we can share someone else's. You recognize when someone else cuts their hand, you don't bleed, but you sure can sympathize. Where did those emotions come from? They came from God. So now you have the ability to care about someone else's pain, even if it doesn't happen to you. So now we can help each other. We have an internal motivation to actually help each other. We talked about tears. Are you aware that emotional tears are different from regular tears? Now, one of the ways you can tell sometimes, at least on your own personal level, is that a lot of times those tears will feel very hot. I've been to funerals before, and you're just sitting there, and you just feel like these hot tears come out of your face and, like, overwhelmingly powerful about it. So here goes what they found. When they looked inside the tears, what they found is that they were loaded with stress hormones, which means that the tears are actually taking the stress from inside of your body and flushing them out. How did that get there? Are you aware that no other creature on the planet has tears like yours when you cry out of sorrow? Remember, he said, I will give sorrow to you. He's speaking to the human beings. That sorrow was not given to the rest of the animal world. That's not to say they don't have feelings, but they don't experience it like we do. And they can't because they can't understand it like we do. Y'all, some of y'all have furry little children and you know that they have feelings, so I'm not saying that they don't. What I'm saying is that there's a unique way in which we sorrow that nothing else does. The other thing they found is that there are chemicals in there that are like endorphins, and if you don't know what endorphins are, they're the stuff that make you feel good and relax. And so there's actually some logic to this idea that if you cry something out, you feel better. And to really prove this point, they found people who had disorders that caused them to not be able to produce tears, and they found that they experience more stress, depression, and they live shorter lives because they can't cry. Now, you might reluctantly do so, but I might invite all of you to thank God for tears. And even on some level, I might even invite you to thank God for pain, because if it wasn't for pain, we'd kill ourselves and not even know we're dying. Now, what else does pain do? Look at this verse right here. It says, the sacrifices of God, Psalm 51, 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. What kind of spirit? A broken spirit and a contrite heart. Do you know what breaks your spirit? It's when we experience pain. So pain not only preserves natural life, it not only encourages us to intervene for others, it not only triggers a response in our bodies that allows us to feel some form of comfort, but it also becomes that first step in salvation. God will never despise anyone who is experiencing pain if they come to him. My children taught me something. Whenever one of them would get in trouble and start crying, well, my wife taught them, and then they really taught us because they took it all the way. So now, whenever one of my children begins to cry, the other one will walk up to him and hug him while he's crying. And it hits me every single time, like, oh, because I'm like ready to, like, to yell, like, why did you do that? And he's over there, and he just goes over there and just like, I still love you. Now, when someone hugs you like that, by the way, the reason why that can mean so much, I had a brother tell me that they um, experienced the death of their father while they were overseas. And while they were there, all the 
church folk were there. They were all lined up. And each one of them said something like, you know, young boy, I'm so sorry that your father is, is dead. You know, he's a good man. And they went all down the line. And he got to the last person. The last person couldn't say a word. He just looked at the little kid and just threw his arms around him. He couldn't say a word. And he, he describes this as being an older man now. And he said he just had tears just falling down his face. And he said, I never forgot that man's name. He didn't say a word to him. He was just there for him. And that has an impact. We can't stop the evils in the world. But we sure can be there for people who go through it. Be there for each other. David speaking, he says, When I consider the heaven, the works of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visitest him, for thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Brothers and sisters, the more I look at everything that surrounds us, whether we're talking about the stars or yourselves, everything around us tells us that God has been mindful of us from the very beginning. Every function in your body, every function in nature, every single one of them has a purpose intended to keep you alive. Because God loves you. And after I read all this stuff, I realized that even the law itself is a miracle because of the foresight, because the fact that God was thinking of us ahead of time. So Solomon tells us, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are what, everyone? Are the issues of life. Brothers and sisters, we have to listen to every word that God gives us because these things are always alive for death. If not for us, then sometimes for someone else. Speaking of conversion, it says, This experience is the highest evidence of divine authorship of the Bible. We receive God's word as food for the soul. We're looking at the last miracle, which is conversion. Through the same evidence by which we receive bread as food for the body, bread supplies the need of our nature. We know by experience that it produces blood, bone, and brain. Apply the same test to the Bible. When its principles have actually become the elements of character, what has been the result? And what changes have been made in the life? Quoting from 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, Old things are what, everyone? Passed away, and behold, all things are become new. And so in that conversion process, the thing that God uses is his word, and it says that old things will pass away as a result of the word of God acting in our lives. In its power, men and women have broken the chains of sinful habit. They have renounced selfishness. The profane become reverent, the drunken sober, the profligate pure. Souls that have been born the likeness of Satan have been transformed into the image of God. This change is itself the miracle of miracles. Why? Because, brothers and sisters, when someone is converted and becomes like God in their lives, they live more like Jesus, then you get to be the presence of God in the life of everyone around you. It is nothing short of a miracle to have God intervene in the lives of others. And if we allow that change to happen in us, then we become that intervention for others. We cannot understand it. We can only believe, as declared in the scriptures, it is Christ where? In you, the hope of glory. So one of the main things that needs to happen in order for us to truly be converted, uh, you can look at there in 1 John 4, 19, it says that we love him because what? Because he first loved us. In order for us to become the people that love God and keep his commandments, we have to first realize that he loves us. Our love is not a creation, it's a response. And you will never have that response if we're not listening. And you will have that response if you are listening. God will show you that he loves you. John 3.16, y'all can quote that with me. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have, yes. God gives his son that we might live. He lets go so that we can have. Now I want you to note something that Jesus says. And Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come, 
that the Son of Man must be glorified. This is found in John chapter 12 for anybody who's following along. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat does what? Falls into the ground and dies. Nothing will happen. God's word can only have an effect if Jesus dies. The miracle of life for us requires the tragedy of death for him. But it says, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it. He that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. So why do I spend so much time on that last piece? Because brothers and sisters, you recognize that every single one of us is alive because Jesus died. But there's something I believe that goes further than this. I read this last passage here. It says, now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. And it says, Father, glorify thy name. Then there came a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Now we started this whole thing talking about how is God glorified? Well, he's glorified through creation. He's glorified through the providences that he puts in our lives. But here goes the place where Jesus or where God says that he is going to glorify his name one more time in the biggest possible way that he can. And how does he glorify his name this one more time? It's by allowing his son to die. Because the greatest glory to God is not his power in creation, but his love and redemption. It is not how powerful he was to create, but how much he loved that he was willing to die. If there was one thing that God wanted you to know about him, it wasn't just that he had all these amazing powers. It's that he wanted you to know that whatever it takes to save you, he will do, and he will give his life so that you can live. But it's not just the mortal life that God wants for us. That's why you find these wonderful words in 2 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. These are our last verses. It's what it says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel. Anybody ever wonder why God is shouting? Yes. It is out of enthusiasm. It is out of excitement. He's so glad to finally see his children. He finally gets to bring you home with him. He finally gets to answer the cries that come from, him, come from the ground to him all the time. He finally gets to make an end of all the evil in this world, and it is no occasion for him to whisper. God wants to come back and gather you with a shout. And now it's not a shout that he's angry at you. It's a shout of come home. Come home. We have no idea how much God longs for us and misses us and desires so much for us to be with him. It is a shout to come home. And so we find these wonderful words. It says, and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Why them first? They are the people that have been away from him as far as he's concerned the longest. When they're dead, he can't talk to them. So he calls forth the people that he has not been able to see in the longest time. It's not unlike what you would do if you came to church. Who are you going to go and make sure you say hi to first? It's going to be that person that you haven't seen in a long time. Because your heart just yearns to be in contact with them once more. So he calls them first. But he doesn't leave us there. It says, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together in, with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And finish that last part for me. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Brothers and sisters, this lifetime is not long enough. All the laws in the world can't keep you alive long enough for God to spend enough time with you. The only amount of time that will ever do for God spending time with you is eternity. Amen. Only forever will do. Let's bow our heads and we'll close our eyes. Our gracious and kind Father, we thank you, Lord, that from the smallest parts of what are necessary for us to live to the greatest part of what was needed for us to live forever, you have given everything. I want to pray today that you would open our eyes, that we would be able to see your working in our lives, that you would open our ears, that we may hear your voice guiding us toward that which begets life and good. Help us to care about the pains of others. Help us, Lord, to 
listen to your words so that we do not cause ourselves unnecessary pain. And change our hearts. Convert us, Lord, for we cannot do this for ourselves. We ask for that miracle of miracles that you would convert us. And we ask for this blessing in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hi, this is David with Wise Ministries. If the message you just heard today has been a blessing to you, please like, share, and subscribe to receive more updates. Please leave any comments or questions you have on any topics you'd like to see us cover in the future below. God bless. Be wise and shine.